guys. We're going to take notes a little differently today. Um, we are going to do them via video. Um, I am able to use my webcam to kind of virtually be there with you as you move through these notes. Um, just know that there will be a little mini quiz at the end of this. Um, so that way I know that you were really taking the notes as if I were there. Hearing is when our ears are able to pick up vibrations of sound in the air. So our hearing depends on sound waves. You can look at this visual and it is really, really detailed. I'm not going to require that you know every part of the ear, but it's important that you're able to identify at least um, how this whole process goes through. Okay, so it goes outer ear, middle ear, inner ear. The inner ear is where it's going to be most important in terms of being able to take all of those sound waves and turn them into something that your brain can understand. Um, we talked about how the, uh, the retina and the rods and the cones in that part of your eye take all of that information and they turn it into something that the brain can understand. The inner ear does that for our sense of hearing. Specifically, it's going to be this snail-like thing right here. This is called the cochlea. Okay, so the cochlea is what takes all of those sound waves and it turns it into neural impulses that the auditory nerve then can send off to the temporal lobe in your brain so that way you can understand and perceive what it is that you're hearing. So there are multiple different ways that we can measure sound. The first is through loudness and we determine that by the amplitude or the height of the sound waves that are being presented to us. So if there is a high amplitude wave, that means that the sound is louder. And if it's a low amplitude wave, then that means that the sound is softer. We measure the strength of loudness or amplitude of a sound wave in decibels, or some people pronounce it decibels, just depends. You have a range of anywhere from 0 to 140 decibels that you can be able to pick up, okay? And any sound over 110 decibels can damage your hearing, um, as well as any kind of persistent sound that is around 85 decibels. So one-time exposure to something over 110 decibels can cause permanent hearing loss, or anything that is kind of relatively constant presentation of sound uh, at around 85 decibels. We've already alluded to this in some of the activities that we've done, but any sound that is painful when you first hear it will damage your hearing if you hear it often enough. And anytime you experience that tone or that bell-like sound um, or a ringing in your ear, that means that permanent damage has been done to these little hair things in the cochlea and that snail shell looking thing in your inner ear. So if you look at this visual, here is the 85 decibel point of prolonged exposure at that frame of reference is going to produce hearing loss. So a busy street corner is at 80 decibels. So if you were probably like, you know, a street vendor in New York City and that was your job, that's prolonged exposure, that's an extended period of time, so more than likely that person would develop some level of hearing loss. 110 decibels is when something uh, is presented just at one time, so if you're standing near a jet plane while the engine is going and it's like 500 feet or closer, you could have uh, permanent hearing loss just from one-time exposure. So that's why those guys that work at uh, airports and on runways, they always have those really big headphones that are kind of noise reducing for themselves. If you go to a rock concert at very close range near an amplifier, so you're you know like 15, 20 rows away, that can be right around 140 decibels. So that is definitely going to cause permanent hearing loss. Pitch is another way that we go about measuring sound, and pitch determines the sound wave's frequency. Okay, so by that we mean how fast the sound wave's vibration is going, okay, the rate of that vibration. Low frequency sounds have deep bass sounds to them, 
and high frequencies are going to have kind of shrill sounds. Pitch is measured in hertz. So we've talked about loudness being measured in decibels. And pitch now, uh, the, how fast a sound wave travels, that is measured in hertz, okay? Humans can have a wide variety of pitch uh, detecting capabilities. We can go anywhere from 16 hertz to 20,000 hertz. The upper limit of audible pitches for us to detect as we age lowers. And the reason why that's the case, and we've kind of touched on this already together, is because your exposure to loud noises over the years damages the ear and the hair cells in it. So as a result of just everyday routine decay, essentially as you age, um, your ability to pick up high pitched frequencies is not nearly as strong as it was when you were younger. So by the time that you hit 60 years old and up, you need a pitch that is a hundred times more intense to be able to pick it up. So this is oftentimes why grandma and grandpa have such a hard time hearing certain um, noises or even sometimes to some extent the sound of your voice. Next thing to discuss is hearing deficits. The most common type of hearing deficit out there is known as noise-induced hearing loss or NIHL. So this is common everyday wear and tear that happens um, just because of everyday exposure to certain things. Um, NIHL can happen from one-time exposure if it is severe enough. It's very rare for that to happen, but it can occur. Usually, though, it's going to be based off of continuous exposure to loud sounds over an extended period of time, okay? What happens is the hair cells in the inner ear, in the cochlea, they are damaged. And once they're damaged, they cannot grow back. So with that in mind, then, here are those pictures I told you about. To the left, you can see a very healthy row of cilia. Cilia are in perfect rows here. You can see that their, you know, their presentation in here is very sharp. They can, you know, differentiate very much so. And then you see damage to the outer hair cells of the inner ear. They're virtually gone. They are non-existent there, okay? And so it's this kind of damage that we were trying to give you the heads up on when you read those articles about teenagers and their hearing loss issues. Two other types of deafness that you should be familiar with for this unit. The first is conduction deafness. Conduction deafness happens when the ear bones in the middle ear that are connected to your eardrum aren't able to transmit sounds from the outer ear inward to the cochlea. So it's kind of a mechanical issue that's going on there. Typically, conduction deafness can be um, alleviated if you get a traditional hearing aid um, or some kind of you know, traditional means of surgery to address that problem. Weirdly enough, someone with conduction deafness could still be able to hear their own voice. And the reason why that is the case is because your voice is conducted, those sound vibrations are conducted to the inner ear through your skull, not the eardrum and the middle ear bones in the mid ear. The other kind of deafness to know about, and this is the most severe, is sensory neural deafness. So this results from damage to the cochlea. It cannot transmit those sound waves, those vibrations, into something that the auditory nerve can understand and then send to your brain. So as a result, the person is unable to hear. And so oftentimes this is where you have um, those with hearing deficits that need to do sign language and so they, they are permanently deaf. More often than not, sensory neural deafness occurs because of heredity. Uh, it can also be present because of multiple sclerosis, because the, ner the nervous system in general and just neurons are not functioning properly with MS. It can also be prolonged exposure to loud noises in certain circumstances um, or other kinds of diseases. 
it is, as I said, a permanent type of deafness. So the only way that this can be helped is through a cochlear implant, which is incredibly expensive. And most health insurances will not pay for these surgeries because they're not considered to be life or death kind of scenarios. So where a cochlear implant is concerned, it's a small electronic device that helps a person develop a sense of sound. So their hearing is not going to be 100%. And their ability to detect sounds and things along those lines, it will be very, very basic at best, okay? It does not restore normal hearing for them. What it does is gives a deaf person a useful interpretation and representation of sounds in their environment to help them to be able to understand speech in particular. There are multiple different parts to the cochlear implant itself. You have a microphone that will pick up the sound from your environment. There's a speech processor involved in it, so that way you can pick up sounds um, from the microphone. There is a transmitter and receiver stimulator that kind of takes those signals from the speech processor, turns them into electric impulses that the brain can understand because we operate via neural electric impulses. And then there's an electrode ray, which is electrodes that are implanted into the cochlea itself um, to kind of stimulate things to send those sound representations to the auditory nerve. A few more things to discuss right before we kind of wrap up all of this on sound information. Localization of sound, our ability to perceive where sound is coming from, is very straightforward. If a noise is in front of you, um, it hits both ears all at once, but if a noise is at your side, it will hit that ear first and be louder in that ear than in the other. So if you turn your head once, you hear a noise. Many times it's more faint than when you first heard it. So if you try just standing there and figuring out where the noise is coming from first, it'll be easier for you to be able to figure out where it's coming from. So if a friend is, you know, if you hear someone calling your name but you don't know where it's coming from, don't start turning around and looking all over every which way to try to figure out who it is. Just stop, wait for them to say it again, and you'll be able to figure it out from there. So localization of sounds helps us to determine the distance, okay? If sound grows closer to us, obviously, we assume that it's coming closer. And if it's fainter, then we can assume that it's further away. Last thing to talk about with the sense of hearing or just the ears in general is your vestibular sense. The vestibular sense is located in your inner ear, and they are three fluid-filled sacs uh, there are semicircular canals in your inner ear that play a key role in your sense of balance. They work with your cerebellum and parts of your motor cortex to provide you with balance and movement. The vestibular responses um, help you when you are spinning, uh, to you know, when you're tilting your head and your body and things like that. When they're overstimulated, that is going to result in a feeling of dizziness, motion sickness, you can get nausea. So for example, if you've ever gone to, you know, one of the church festivals around here during, you know, late spring, beginning of summer, all the way through the summer, a lot of times they have those rides with the strawberries that you jump inside one of them and then you've got like this big wheel and you guys just, you turn it and you turn it and it just spins the bejesus out of you. A lot of people get very sensitive to that amount of motion and so they develop motion sickness and dizziness as a result. The reason why is because the vestibular sense in your inner ear was overly stimulated. Um, without your vestibular sense, you're unable to stand and walk uh, without stumbling or falling over. It's possible if you develop an inner ear infection, for example, to uh, develop something they call vertigo, which is an inability to stand up and walk straight. So hopefully the way that we did these set of notes today was beneficial for you, um, that you learned a little bit, uh, and if you needed to stop and start it when it was necessary, you had that opportunity. If you have a little bit of time before you are asked to take the quiz for this set of notes, you might want to go back and check and just make sure that you've got all the information that you need and then you can take the quiz itself.